greetings. I welcome you to our worship service here at Bethel United Church of Christ in Evansville, Indiana. I'm Reverend Samuel Buer, and I'm pleased to say that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here, here in this place where we strive to be united in seeking God's will and in serving all people. So again, we welcome all of you who have braved the, the weather this morning and gathered with us in person, as well as those that are joining with us online uh, this day. Uh, throughout this month of May, we've, the offering that we've been collecting for is the Strength in the Church offering, that wider church offering, so I again encourage you to be generous with that as well. I um, want to do a couple of celebrations. Uh, last weekend, and quite a number of us from this church joined with many others on the riverfront for, to support Habitat for Humanity. Uh, Habitat, there was a program called Walking for Dreams, and there were uh, 15 or more uh, non-for-profits that were there raising funds, and with a number of walkers, and Habitat won the prize of having the most walkers. I don't know how many were there, but it was well over 100. Uh, and, and I could see that some of them were some of the, the future homeowners that were walking as well. And then it was also announced that uh, sometime this past week, their goal, Habitat's goal was around 120,000, because if they raised that, they would get another 20,000 from the foundation. And by Monday, after they totaled up what happened on Sunday, they had $103,000 in hand. So they were well on their way towards that. So we hope they made that goal. Um, also, another joy was we gathered here on Friday morning and 17 little young ones from our preschool graduated from our program here and are ready now to attend kindergarten. So what a joy it was. To, and I know Teddy, your grandson, was one of those. What, what fun that was. And also this place is busy on weekday, weekdays and weekends now. We've got 38 youth participating in our summer musicals. So a lot of programs underway here and what, what joy there is in this place. With those the announcements that I had, let us turn now to our time of worship with a call to worship. We gather this morning in the name of the Creator who creates time and space, galaxies, stars and planets. In the name of Jesus Christ, born on planet Earth. And in the name of the Spirit who fills the Earth with its presence. Creator God, in this time we call now, in the space we call here, we worship you. Make your presence felt among us. I would invite those who are able to rise as we sing for the beauty of the Earth. I invite you to turn to the prayer of discipleship for this day. O divine voice, you sing and the universe comes into being. O divine breath, you breathe and all things spring to life. O divine word, you call and creation is sustained. 
O divine flesh, you are born among us, and the Creator is clothed in creation. O divine spirit, you feel all that has been formed. And O divine life, you are the pulse of all that is, in amazement and awe, in wonder and in celebration. We marvel at this mystery. In you all things live and move and have being. In all things you live, move, and express your divine artistry. And so we join with creation, the eternal song of worship and wonder. Amen. I invite you all to be seated. I invite Abby to come forward for the thoughts for young believers this morning. And again, any young folks that are with us. So today I brought us a pack of gum, but it's not actually gum. Because you know how sometimes you want things and you ask me for it, but you might not get to pick, you might not get to pick exactly what you get. We love to hear him testify. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes if you get gum or you get candy, you might not always get what you want, right? Is that right? Yes. Sometimes when you go to the store, do you always get what you want, Dante, or sometimes do you get different things? Sometimes I get different things. <laughs> so I brought this pack of gum, and this is all the same flavor, but it's actually not gum. Can you pick one out? SJ, can you get one of these? Good job. Jenny. Thank you. Dante. Thank you. River. River. Uh -uh. Let's give one to River. And one for me. It does feel like I took the actual gum out. So we don't always get to pick what's given to us. Like I brought this gum today called Polar Ice, but that might not be your favorite flavor. It might be Dante's favorite, but not Journey's favorite. Is this your favorite kind of gum, or do you like fruity gum? No. No. Okay. So he doesn't even like gum at all today. But sometimes we can't pick what we're given. And the same thing goes with our feelings. Sometimes you can't help what you feel. And you can't help your feelings. And so on your paper, that I'm pretending like is a piece of gum, if you look at the blue word, it tells us something that sometimes we feel, but we can't help it. Even if we don't really want that one, we can't help it. Mine says, Journey, look at this. Mine says scared. But I have a question. Instead of being scared... Are you ever brave sometimes, Journey? Yes. Yeah. And sometimes it's really hard to be brave if you're scared. But do you know what you can do if you feel scared? Let me tell you something. Do you know what you can do if you're ever scared? You can pray. Because you know how we always tell you that God loves us and God's there for us and he believes in us? We say those kind of things, right? But I think sometimes we forget to tell you guys that it's really simple. You can just pray. When you need help, you can pray. When you have a big feeling and you don't know what to do with it, like being scared, if you pray to God, you know how we pray at night before you go to sleep sometimes? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? Sometimes when we pray, when we say, please help us, and we ask God for help for things, if you have a big feeling that you don't know what to do with, you can pray and ask him to change it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you. And he can change it around, just like magic. Okay? So when I feel scared, I pray to God, please help me be brave. Like SJ, he was so brave when he threw that, right? <laughs> and he might be a little bit frustrated. So maybe he would pray, please help me not be frustrated. Journey, yours says, let me tell you what yours says. Worry. Worry. Sometimes if you're worried and you, helped God, you, you needed help from God, you could pray and say, please don't let me be worried. Please help me find comfort. Okay? And River, River says, Sad. 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 But we don't want River to be sad. We want River to be what? Happy. Yeah, so we can pray to God and say, please don't make River sad. Please make him happy. And Dante, what does yours say? Jealousy. And if you feel jealous at school sometimes because other parents get kids really, really expensive, cool things, and I don't, 
What could you pray to God for help with besides a new mom? Um, a new mom. <laughs> and what else? I don't, just be grateful. Yes. And Jenny, what does yours say? Mine actually says mad. Oh, and if, if we're mad, if we're mad, we can pray to God to help us be not mad, right? And so is it okay? Do you want to pray with me, Journey? I wrote a prayer on the back of this box. Can you help me? Dear God, help us remember that when we need help with our big feelings, with our big feeling, we can pray to you. We can pray to you. Let the grown-ups remember that too. Let the grown-ups remember that too. Help us all. Help us all. Turn hate into love. Turn hate into love. Sad into happy. Sad into happy. Scared into brave. Scared into brave. Worry into comfort. Worry into comfort. Jealousy into grateful. Jealousy into grateful. Mean into kind. Mean into kind. Impatient. Impatient. Into understanding. Into understanding. Mad into calm. Mad into calm. And let all of our troubles. And all of our worries worries. find their way to you you. through our prayers prayers. today, Today. tomorrow, Tomorrow. and always. always. Amen. 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 We have commentary on our scripture this morning from Ronald Hindle. He's a professor of Hebrew Bible and Jewish studies at the University of California, Berkeley. In the book of Genesis, a biography, he writes that while a book isn't an organism, it has a life and an afterlife. Genesis spoke to the people of its time, its life story, which is what the word biography means, is one subplot in the complicated history of our collective life in Western civilization. Its life is a part of our own biography in the long span of human culture. There is the life of the story itself, and there is the afterlife, composed of many interpretations. So we could say that I am reading the life of Genesis, the story itself, and Reverend Buer's sermon will provide a part of its afterlife. A reading from the second and third chapters of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field, but for the man there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. 
Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of his fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. May God's Spirit help us live out the afterlife in faithful ways. Thank you, Mike. Let's bow our heads for a moment now as he Come to God in a time of prayer, let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in thy sight. O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. There was a very wise Persian mystic from the 14th century by, by the name of Hafez. One time he reflected on a regret that he had wrote, and this is his regret. One regret, dear world, that I am determined not to have when I'm lying on my deathbed is that I did not kiss you enough. Let me repeat that one. One regret, dear world, that I am determined not to have on my deathbed is that I did not kiss you enough. Kevin Anderson, a psychologist and a spiritual writer in, in his book, The Inconceivable Surprise, reflected upon that quote and with this thought that he added, kissing the world or being kissed by it, either way keeps the spark in my love affair with life. Wonderful writer. Kissing the world, he wrote, kissing the world or being kissed by it, either way keeps the spark in my love affair with life being kissed by the world. So hold that imagery, being kiss, kissing the world or being kissed by it. And now I'm gonna move in a whole different direction. This goes to a quote that, uh, that I remember hearing back around 9-11. You might remember United States Secretary of Defense Ronald Rumsfeld, Donald Rumsfeld, excuse me, in a news brief, they were talking, he was talking about the lack of evidence linking the government of Iraq with the sly, supply of weapons of mass destruction. And this is one of my favorite quotes that I've heard from somebody, from a politician or, or a military person for some time. Rumsfeld said, reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me because as we know, there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And if one looks throughout the history of our country and other free countries, it's the latter category that tend to be the difficult ones. 
the unknown unknowns. The problem is when we run into difficult situations or difficult things, we tend to put easy answers on them. Or what we often do is never question what it is we think we know. So I want to do that today with this Adam and Eve story from the book of Genesis. For many years, in, when I was growing up as well, the central truth of this story we were taught was this is a story of original sin. We never questioned this known known because we knew it. But what if it was an unknown unknown? I'm going to invite us to do a little bit of a Bible study here and some historical study. It takes us back to Augustine of Hippo in the 4th century. Augustine, one of the church fathers, in the 4th century, mind you, was the person that first developed the idea in a significant way of original sin. So any readings of this text prior to the 4th century, original sin wasn't applied to it. It wasn't until Augustine in his studies applied it, and then the church took it on ever after. Hmm, wonder why. Well, here's some interesting things to know about Augustine and what he was dealing with at that time. Augustine had two difficult issues in his life that caused him a great deal of difficulty. Now again, he's a church father, he's a, he's a priest, been for many years. But one of the issues that he was dealing with was he was very sexual, sexually promiscuous as a young man. That was a part of his history. Plus, while serving as an ordained priest, he was involved with a woman in a love affair that lasted two decades. unmarried. At the same time that, that those issues that he was dealing with, or not, maybe you should say not dealing with, he was also involved in a church fight that centered around the issue of evil and its source. And so he was about trying to answer, how did evil come into this world? So maybe through some transference of his of not dealing with his own issues, he laid his issues of evil, the evil in his life, on this text. And he said, it's the original sin. And he laid it upon the woman, Eve. And ever since the fourth century, this has been the understanding of the church, universal. It wasn't until recent times that we started to question that original or that assumption of the fourth century original sin. And we began to realize that was a real easy answer that he applied to that text. And the result was it has subjugated women for the last 16 or more centuries blaming women for original sin. So rather than owning his own issues, he took an easy answer, but what for him became a known known. But he didn't know it. He was used that interpretation to justify his lifestyle. And the result was, again, the mistreatment of women for many, many centuries, made to feel less than. Walter Brueggemann, a UCC scholar, a beautiful, wonderful Hebrew scholar, said of this text, nothing could be more remote from the narrative than the fall, the original sin. Walter Brueggemann, a Hebrew scholar, I suspect much more so than Augustine, said the fall or original sin is way remote from this text. It doesn't belong there. So let's take a look at this text. 
And so I want to address some of our known knowns, and I'm going to put some questions out here this morning so that we can kind of open up where we're at with this text. And our, most of us have read this text from the time we were little on through, and we've heard it read in many different ways. So what's the fruit that Eve took and ate? We know what it is, don't we? It was an apple, right? Read the text again. It's a banana. It's not named at all. But we see it in paintings and all kinds of places, and we believe it's an apple. It's something we've placed, or somebody has placed into that text a long time ago, just like Augustine did. So, I'm challenging us to put those kind of things aside. And let's learn a little bit more about this text. The reading we use today used man and woman. It didn't use the names of Adam and Eve, but it could have. Adam, Hebrew word, could be a place name, could be a first name. But also in Hebrew, it's definitely plural. It's not singular. It could be translated as people rather than man. If it's translated people, all of a sudden that story starts to transition itself. Okay. Throw another curveball into this one. The name Eve means woman but that's not singular, it's plural. Many women. Oh, so is this a story about a couple, Adam and Eve, as singular as a couple? Or is it about a story of a people learning a great truth? Starting to stretch our mind here a bit. Another interesting one. In a text it says, Lord God sees Adam, this people, that needs a helper. And so puts this Adam asleep and out of Adam's ribs, out of his body, a rib is taken and a helper is made. What's interesting about that word helper, it's used 30 times in the Hebrew text, in the Hebrew scriptures. It's used 30 times, and of those 30 times, one-third of them is a reference to God Almighty. Not less than, greater than. So where is the story going? Well, let's add to it. Anybody enjoy reading mythology? I remember when I was young in life and college age or so, Joseph Campbell was pretty big at that time and had written several books and there was a, 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 a seminar on TV where he was being interviewed time and time again. And I learned a lot from him about mythology and how it taught me how to read our text in a more expansive way. We have a serpent. In mythology, there's oftentimes serpents in stories. We think of the serpent as being a despicable person that, or despicable creature that tempted Eve or tempted this woman to do something that the woman shouldn't have done and then also the man included. Campbell taught me not so. Oftentimes in mythology, there's a, some sort of a creature who plays the role of a trickster. In American Indian mythology, it's oftentimes a raven. But in this Hebrew story, the trickster is the serpent. And the trickster's role is to get the person in that story to see the world in a different way, to experience it in a more expansive way. The, Trickster's role is to interject into the known order, that known known, 
what is unknown, to see something new. So here's a question. Here's a challenge. I don't know if there's any literalists in the room today, but here's a challenge for you if you're a literalist. Who lied in this story? Who lied? In the text, it says, God said, on this day that you eat this fruit, you will surely die. The serpent, the trickster, says, on the day that you eat this fruit, you will not die, but you will know the difference between good and evil. Who's lying? Or maybe I should really ask, who's telling the truth? Is the serpent telling the truth? Or is God telling the truth? And the answer is yes. Because God is this trickster in the story. The trickster, the serpent, is another form of God. Now, did you just blow your mind on that one? In that moment, the people, Adam and Eve, the males and the females, their eyes were opened, and now they became like God. And now they knew the difference between good and evil. And when you know the difference between good and evil, life becomes complicated. And you've now moved from childhood, from that innocent being a child, you've moved into adulthood. And you can't ever go back. That's why the story says there were flaming swords placed at the boundaries of Eden. Because they couldn't go back. They couldn't undo what they now know. And now they're more like God. They can no longer, they're no longer those innocents. Life has just now got a whole lot more complicated. Was there ever a time in your life when it got complicated and you just say, I want to go home? Meaning back to those innocent times, and you can't. Eden was not that perfect place that we've done tend to taught it was. It was an innocent place, but it's not a perfect place because now they knew good from evil. And they were more fully human in that knowledge. And then the story unfolds and there's all more kinds of ways that the story is, is telling things. You know, it says about the snakes. Snakes, why do they crawl on their belly? And it tries to answer that one. It tries to answer the pain of childbirth. I think all of these things I suspect, I'm not the greatest scholar, Hebrew scholar, but I think many of these things were added for all those of us later to understand the story more fully in other ways. But the greatest truth is that we were entrusted, we have been entrusted with a great gift. And that is that we know the difference between good and evil. And the challenge then for us is to do that great good and become that great good and not practice those great evils that we're seeing practiced today in places like Ukraine, and in Gaza, and in Israel, and other places that I don't name. Our role is to build up and not tear down. So this story identifies that each one of us, because this is our story, we are a part of that, those males and those females in this story, when we became adults, and we've been given a gift. And the question now goes back to where I began. Will we kiss the world 
and allow the world to kiss us so that when we get to our deathbed, there won't be any regrets because we lived life well. So I'm grateful for the story of Adam and Eve. I'm grateful that Eve, the woman, or the woman, the many women, took that banana and took a bite of it and opened all of our eyes to the possibilities of what is so wonderful in this world. It's a wonderful story. It's our story. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's now sing, My Hope is Built on the Solid Rock. And invite those who are able to stand as we sing. <clears throat> as we turn now to a time of prayer. And again, let us keep in our prayers Mardell's family and also Mary Ann and Betty who need God's healing touch as well as all those that are caught up in places of war. Let us bow our heads now for a moment for prayer. Let us pray. O holy God, you set before us ways of life and death, and we've been blessed with stories of great truths from long ago that stand the test of time and are yet still our truths. So we focus this morning on the creation story in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Thank you for opening our eyes to seeing in new ways, not only that story, but also our very lives. And for this, we are thankful. As we come in prayer, we have many different prayers to offer to you. So now in the stillness of this morning hour, hear now the prayers of your people. Hear our prayers. O oh God.
Hear these our prayers, O God. And now let us join in the prayer that binds us with Christians around the world and across the ages as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now this closing song, Savior like a shepherd lead us. Again, I invite those who are able to rise as we sing. Let us now dedicate our gifts of our time and our talents and treasures to God. Please pray with me. Holy God, we praise and thank you for your encircling love. May these gifts be an outward sign of the love that we carry for you and for our neighbors. Multiply and bless these gifts and the work we shall do so that your kingdom comes a little nearer to our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now let us join together in these words of the benediction. May the blessing of the God of peace and justice be with us. May the blessing of the Son, who weeps the tears of the world's suffering, be with us. And may the blessing of the Spirit who inspires us to reconciliation and hope, be with us from now into eternity. Amen. This service has ended. Your service now begins. And I'm pleased to announce that the 40 days of rain has ended, and so you can go out into the clearness of the sky. Go in peace, my friends. Amen. <laughs>